Hey, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Good. That's both of you can hear me. That's all good. Um, so, the talk title, in fact, the entire talk, came from a possibly 15 second conversation, which was uh, basically uh, Hi, uh, we're doing stuff, we're doing talks for open source and crypto. And I said, and, and you know, is, is uh, open source crypto a good thing? And I'm like, well, yes. Except kind of there's more complications. He goes, great, do a talk about that. So that was how I got lumped with this. Um, so, hi, I'm Glenn. I'm another person who breaks things for a living. Um, it's kind of important uh, that people who break things for a living talk to people who make things for a living. Uh, Partly because some of the stuff that we do every day, it's not, not quite turn handle, you have to think about it, but a lot of the basic tools that we use uh, and a lot of the problems we encounter are the same problems again and again and again because most of the defenders don't know about them. Um, I actually wrote down two or three little things I was going to note down because I've got a bunch of people in the room that should, I should say this to. Uh, the most important thing uh, off the back of that talk, by the way, was the hashing uh, statement. <laughs> If any of you are doing anything with passwords, and if you take nothing else away from this entire meeting, please take this away. Uh, please could you use either bcrypt, scrypt, or if you're feeling really fancy, argon2, but you're being a bit excited on that point. Um, if you're doing anything else for your hashing, you're doing it wrong. And please don't write your own hashing algorithm. Even though you do come to a crypto meetup, please, please don't do that. Uh, anyway, back onto my talk. Um, question to the room. Should you use open source crypto? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Any no's? Nope. Got one no. Well done. <laughs> yes. So, um, uh, the answer is yes, sort of maybe kind of, right, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, welcome to all of computing. I think we can sum up most questions that get asked of people in computing. The, the, the short version is always yes, and the slightly longer version is, well, there's some conditionals. Um, so I was trying to work out how to do that in a fun way, because there was quite an easy way to do a very boring talk on that. Uh, and uh, someone being very cheeky started trying to come up with um, defenses uh, that various people had actually given a very piece of time for why you should use closed source crypto. What was interesting is the first couple of ones were really quite funny, but then they actually got to actually quite good arguments. So we'll start off with the, the funny ones. Um, yes, I always put something funny in the slides because that way people will laugh at something. Um, one of the things, once again, handy link from the previous talk, uh, security as a, as a phrase doesn't really mean a lot. Uh, if you're trying to do security properly, you end up talking about threat models, i.e. who you're trying to protect against, what are your assets, how much effort they're going to use against you. If you think you've made your hardware so that no one could possibly read something off it and they have infinite time and infinite resources, I've got some really bad news for you. You're probably doing it wrong. Um, and the NSA and GCSQ are definitely using proprietary crypto. I mean, they're also using some open source crypto as well and some well-known techniques, but they're, they're entirely inventing crypto. Um, I think part of the easy answer, if anyone uses this as an argument uh, for why you should be using uh, a closed source crypto, uh, would be, do you have a thousand cryptographers on staff? Do you have people whose dedicated job is to break crypto? Everyone think that that should be an easy, quick argument. Yes? Good, great. I can move on. Or, or anyone want to argue that that's a terrible argument? Great. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> this argument and meta versions of this argument actually gets used a lot, uh, which is the... Uh, our embedded device if, uh, contains a proprietary crypto. 
but at its most simple form, uh, high, uh, it just makes it harder for the attacker if you can't read it. Uh, this ignores a bunch of interesting things. So the first thing is that in all probability, one of two things has happened. They have either decided to invent their own crypto, in which case it's horribly broken, trivially and very fast. Uh, and what's interesting is that for the attackers, this stuff is normally very, very quick. Because we know a bunch of techniques, we'll try them all, and most people come up with the same things, and you just get through. Um, if they haven't invented their own crypto, then they're using a well-known algorithm. And so the fact that they're trying to hide their secret sauce inside in some way doesn't really help them too much on this. Um, but it, it, the most metaphor of the argument ends up being it's a speed bump. Same thing with the hardware. It's like, how much, how much effort will we make them do, Mr. Attacker? And how much effort is Mr. Attacker willing to make against our system? Surely that has to be worth something. Everyone think that that's a good argument. Would, would somebody from the NSA or GCHQ make this argument? That's okay. They wouldn't make that about their own systems, definitely not. Uh, but they certainly uh, will make it painful, amongst other things. But uh, they are very good at assuming that uh, the attacker knows every part of the implementation and that it should still be secure. Um, but that there is uh, incentive, once again, yeah, if, you're, if you're TCHQ, uh, there are advantages for you to, make it, to making the attacker have to go physically near stuff or to intercept stuff. Uh, if you don't have the in-house capability to check your stuff correctly, uh, there are advantages in uh, getting your customers to pay other people to check your stuff. And that's it. What about the plus DCMA? Say again? What about the, the plus DMCA argument here? The question was... You're using lousy crypto, but you're protected by the law. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the argument here, well, the question here is, what about basically uh, using uh, the law, American or British, uh, to justify using lousy crypto? And the good answer is, I'm trying not to make that argument right now, but I have previously done it in, the DCM, uh, in this actual room about the UK law. But we'll come back to that one if we have time. Um, right. I just love that mouse, that's brilliant. Um, so, uh, why are we hiding it all? Because we have, we have uh, proprietary intellectual property stuff in our things. Uh, there are several very popular messaging platforms whose fundamental crypto they don't release. And when asked why, they say, because of our intellectual property. What's interesting is that this is, uh, of the arguments we've made so far, this is a very successful argument. It might not be a very logical argument, but it's a very successful argument. Several companies have convinced lots of people that's a reasonable thing to do. Does everyone in the room think it's a reasonable thing to do? Is everyone in the room going to stop answering all questions now? Yes, Definitely. Is Good. Um, yes, I mean, that, that's actually partly why I've built it this way, is that uh, so many of these arguments that you'll start seeing later on, which are successful, are actually just variations on the earlier arguments. Uh, and protecting your intellectual property is almost a combination of both of the two previous ones. Uh, if they can't explain to you how the crypto works, then that's definitely all alarm bells ringing, go somewhere else. If they say, this is how it works, but we won't tell you the code of how it's doing it, at least it gives you a chance to check that. that someone gets the chance to check that. Um, so normally when you're doing you know, communications or whatever, <coughs> and they say, hey, it's secure because you know, the worst case example of this, you know, our military grade encryption, um, then that should ring every alarm bell going. And, and many of these, uh, we're protecting our intellectual property, so we can't tell you how all the crypto works uh, arguments should default down to, we have military grade encryption, which means it's, it's brilliant. Or to the attackers, this means you can break it in about 20 seconds. I, in fact, if you find, it's a good Google search to do actually, you know, uh, we have military grade encryption. It's amazing the number of things that come back as a hit. Amazing the number of ones if you then search for exploit. 
you'll see how to exploit every one of them instantly. Um, <laughs> so then there's fun, there's some great ones, just plain wrong arguments, those are nice ones. Um, and you can get support contracts on open source and closed source, so wrong, wrong argument. Uh, really interesting one, uh, why it's even more wrong than normal, is that uh, you can get support contracts from multiple people if it's open source, and probably from only one people if it's uh, closed source. So, yay capitalism! Uh, someone actually described this as the capitalism argument, and it's actually an anti-capitalism argument. Um, we've just had a talk on this. Does everyone think that just because it's on a piece of hardware now that we won't be able to extract the source code? Good. Uh, this, is, this is really funny because Microsoft has now published their crypto. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a particularly uh, dead version of the argument. Uh, it gets more interesting when you use um, other company names, but we'll start off with Microsoft. Microsoft's crypto library, uh, if you haven't had a look at it recently, is, is great fun to read. Uh, Travis Goodspeed, who actually was nearly in tears when they did it because he'd just finished a binary analysis of their entire crypto library. And then he got the source code like two days afterwards. Um, but one of the things that uh, everyone really, really loved was that one of their hashing algorithms, I'm trying to think which one it was now, DES. That they had DES as one of their available hashing algorithms. And if you ran it, it actually ran SHA-256 on it. Um, and the comment alongside explained this thing that everyone, puzzled everyone who ever actually tried to do reverse engineer this. Uh, and the comment alongside it said, yeah, if they're trying to run DES, they've got other problems. We'll just make their life slightly easier. Uh, <laughs> um, but one of the byproducts of this is like sometimes with the closed source libraries, you find that the thing's not doing what it's even claiming to be doing. Um, okay, this is actually the strongest argument of the lot I'm going to give so far. Um, I want to do it. I want to do something. I don't want to write it myself, and there's no open source version of it. I'm a business, and it would be bonkers for me to write it myself. I think that's a strong argument. I think that's one of the reasons why there's nuance, rather than just saying, yes, you should use open source crypto. Uh, often the things that you are using, hopefully they're using open source crypto. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you find something, and it has been audited by someone, hopefully, and it's rather popular, this may or may not be some kind of indication that it is good. You are taking a risk-based decision. Welcome to security. Uh, it can just become quite exciting if they start saying things like, we won't explain how this works, don't worry, it's magic, and it's got military grade encryption. These possibly should be magic buzzwords that tell you to run away and scream. Uh, likewise, yes, if you, go looking for, uh, if you go looking and do find that there are uh, equivalents that at least explain what they're doing, or even better, publish the source code for what they're doing, probably I'd recommend you go that way. But as with all things, especially things that use crypto, just because it's open source does not mean it is secure. I mean, if you don't believe that, I mean, I, I, I tried to do a quick one where we uh, started looking uh, at uh, uncommon WordPress plugins. Uh, for crypto failings uh, this morning. Unfortunately, all of them have not patched yet. Um, the answer is it's trivial to find lots and lots of open source projects with really trivial crypto problems in them. And it's possible to find some closed source things where their crypto is pretty good. And they screw up on other things, but they're pretty good on their crypto. So there are more things you need to take into account than just, is it open source, is it closed source? Everyone with me again, or once again, has everyone gone completely quiet? Yes. <laughs> Software contains bugs. Anyone want to believe that their code does not contain any bugs? I don't have any code. Uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I make this claim, will you order it for me? Sure, at a reasonable rate. Um, <laughs> uh, crypto is hard. Who believes that? Who doesn't believe that? Woo! Now those are the people whose code you should audit. <laughs> um, the, I think a lot of 
problems in all of crypto and a lot of the reasons why um, well, attacking is always easier than defending anyway, but attacking crypto is normally trivial. Uh, it's either, well, actually, that's not true. It's normally trivial or incredibly hard. Uh, if they've written it themselves, it's trivial. If it's misconfigured, if it's a long list of things, then it's trivial. Um, and one of the reasons why is that normally the defenders don't realize it's hard. Merely understanding that it's a hard thing to do would probably have caused them to do it a different way, or get someone else to do it, or use a well-known library. Um, yeah, it's just the trivial details, it's just the crypto will go wrong. Um, right, so this is the one where I have to... Uh, what I would love to be able to do, is everything I've just said is not empirical. It's my experiences and it's thinking about it. What I'd love to be able to do is to say, here are some concrete measurable things, thus proving that you should use open source crypto rather than using closed source crypto. I don't need to make this as a coherent argument. I'll just give you the numbers and I win. Uh, what's really interesting is you go and look at the academic research on this. Lots of people have tried to do this and even think they've succeeded. I, I, I personally think that they're wrong. Um, a thing that was previously mentioned, CVEs, I, I, the common uh, methodology you see when people try and prove this stuff is that they, they go and look for CVEs in open source projects that use crypto and they go and look for CVEs in closed source projects that have crypto and then they think that this has some meaning when they compare these two numbers against each other. And what ends up happening in reality is you find out which projects have been looked at by someone, uh, which projects someone has paid money to have it looked at, which projects someone has paid money to have it looked at and then not paid the money to not publish it. Uh, what things have taken random people's interest. Uh, once again, uh, it's probably worth mentioning Travis again. Travis will occasionally just take a random interest in something and then there's about 2,000 CVEs two weeks later. Um, that doesn't mean that that bunch of stuff is more vulnerable than other things. It just means that someone who actually knew what they're doing looked at it. Uh, so I don't actually think there is an easy way of getting empirical numbers for this. And even if I did, where I did a bunch of checking on stuff, that would just probably be more weighted on what random things I chose to check. What about time to fix? Ah, yes, time to fix on open source projects versus closed source projects. And the answer is, once again, in my experience, Cointos couldn't tell you. Uh, some closed source, some open source projects, you contact them, they uh, within five minutes have an email back going, we acknowledge this, we are uh, writing the fix now, we'll send you another one in 10 minutes time, can you run a check on it please? And then they push the update out and everyone just gets patched. And uh, the longest I've had on a uh, response uh, from a closed source was two years to patch. Uh, the longest I've had on, well, okay, of the ones who've patched, uh, for both open source and closed source, I've had ones where we go, hi, here's arbitrary code on your thing. And they go, okay, no patch. Those definitely have CVEs, but that doesn't mean anything if no one's looking. Um, right, so I'm now trying to get all the things that were in my description included in the slide deck somewhere. Um, <laughs> So, how has threat models, so once again, threat models are what you're trying to defend, how much effort is the attacker trying to put in, what's your goal, those kind of questions. If you put them together, then you can decide on what measures you're going to do for your defense. And how has that been changed by crypto and open source crypto and closed source crypto over time? And some of these are really interesting. Um, if you go back over a longer period than 20 years, you end up finding that um, there doesn't appear to have been any threat models. <laughs> uh, people were doing things either because they thought that was the right thing to do, or uh, they were really worried about one person doing one thing against them and ignoring everything else. Um, one of the things you found in the last 20 years is we've gone from, uh, uh, you know, my network is secure so I don't need to use crypto. Uh, 
most famously Google. Um, or just about every Windows network still sometimes today. Um, and sometimes that's conscious decision, most frequently that's just ignorance. They just assume it must be secure. And you're finding more and more, certainly for large companies now, just assume, I mean, once again, there were companies 20 years ago that were assuming that the corporate networks weren't secure and would do things, and there were still a hell of a lot of companies that don't. And now we've progressed a little bit. Some of the big companies are doing lots of stuff encrypted, and you can't disconnect to the network, and everything's cool, and some aren't. There is no difference I can tell uh, that is directly attributable to open source rather than closed source, other than open source generally tends to be, some of it is free, especially when it comes to crypto libraries, so it's become a lot easier for people to just start sprinkling it in their, in their systems. The biggest problem that's stopping things is not now difficulty of implementation, it's that the most of the customers don't know to check or don't think to ask. So if there's no market pressure, they don't do it. So things have changed a little bit in that it's a bit cheaper to do some of it. Um, who in the room writes crypto? Yes. Who in the room uses crypto? Who in the room has not put their hand up? <laughs> really? <laughs> And who in the room is just lying to all of the questions? Uh, yes, well done. <laughs> um, yes, I, 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 would, I, I think that this is probably one, another one of those really important lessons. Uh, if you actually look at the things when you're actually attacking crypto, and you go and ask people who attack systems for a living, uh, is the crypto the thing that caused you the problem? Uh, one of the standard answers is what crypto? Uh, Another one was, why was crypto relevant? I could connect to the website and it was encrypted. Yay, I can still send messages to the website. Um, so I think there's a whole class of stuff where you find that people think that they're secure because crypto is involved somewhere. And that really depends about what you're thinking about. It's probably about sniffing attacks or something, but if you're not actually worried about that, then sprinkling magic crypto dust does not make it secure. Um, We've kind of covered this. Please don't write your own crypto. <laughs> there are perhaps 20 people in the world I would trust to write their own crypto. <laughs> um, if you think you can write your own crypto, please <coughs> send whatever crypto you've written to one of the mailing lists, and then within 15 minutes you'll find out you can't write crypto. Um, What's actually far more common is uh, you find people who are using their preferred programming language and they want to do some algorithm and they find out that it's not available in their standard packages, so they write it themselves. Because how hard could it be? This goes horribly wrong. <laughs> Writing crypto is very, very hard, even when you know exactly what the algorithm is. Doing it correctly is incredibly hard. Doing it correctly without getting anyone else to go and critique it is very optimistic. So where's the boundary? If I use a crypto library for some stuff, am I doing my own or am I using the library? Yes. So if you use, which one we got here? If you use, well, I'll have that up on the screen as well. If you use uh, a well-known crypto library with good documentation, that would be my other big learning for any of you who are actually involved in crypto libraries and writing them, is a great library with brilliant implementation and terrible documentation is useless. In fact, it's worse than useless, it's dangerous. Uh, there are, one of the reasons why actually this type of attack works really well, you, you, you go to Pastebin or you go, no, you, you go to Stack Overflow and like, type in whatever it is, programming language name, find out what the very first answer for it is, and that's probably what the implementation done by the coder was. And they'll use a library. They might even be using the right library wrongly, because these things need to be configured correctly and used in the right circumstances. And the reason why, one of the reasons why people are copy and pasting is that they just try, don't understand the magic gibberish when they try and read the documentation about how to actually use it. Uh, 
Open source has a bit of a reputation, depending on the project once again, on not always having the best documentation. And in this field it matters a lot. Uh, of course, some projects have like fantastic people who are very, very good at writing readable English. These people should be protected. <laughs> they are very valuable. Um, yes, okay, the billion miles an hour version. Uh, so they've used crypto, they've used the reasonable library, and they've hard-coded their key into the software that goes everywhere. And 15 seconds after we've got our hands on the software that's gone everywhere, we've read out the key and now we can read out all the crypto. Did everyone think that was a complicated attack? I would say 10% of attacks might work that way. That's crazy. Uh, so then they move up and they start using um, uh, keys that basically are predictable. But this is the whole class of this type. Uh, they use, I don't know, system time to work out what the initialization is for the key. Or some other thing that's entirely predictable. So as an attacker, this brilliant, wonderful crypto that's using all the right stuff and then has a known predictable key because you know the communication started at exactly this time. So then go, you know, rand, give me a number, which will probably be time-based. Uh, next dev mistake, once again, these go on and they get worse and worse and worse. Uh, and some of them are less plausible. But uh, a very common failing is they read the first line of the documentation and didn't get down to line 16 that said, warning, don't do this. Um, Microsoft has actually got quite good at this. If there is a warning statement in some of the documentation nowadays, they have a bright yellow bar at the top. PHP, since Facebook decided to document it properly, started having quite interesting, uh, they, they, I think they almost considered doing flashing warnings, but they obviously didn't do it in the end, but th th they have quite interesting warning blocks. Uh, but, you know, go and look at the OpenSSL documentation on how to use it and then spot what the dangerous things are in there. <coughs> um, yeah, bad documentation talked about it already. Uh, so, really, other main principles to take away. If it's complex, it's going to have bugs in it. If it's simple, it's less likely to have bugs in it. Crypto is complex. Either what you have written is complex, or what someone else has written and you're depending on is complex. Therefore, there is going to be bugs in it. You want as many eyeballs as possible. One of the counter arguments of this is that at a certain point, the eyeballs that you need, there aren't that many people with those eyeballs. Well, the easier it is for them to get their eyes on it, the better. Um, do ask people for help. There are quite a lot of people on some of the right mailing lists who find this stuff fun and do it as a hobby. If you are doing something with crypto, it's not a problem to go and ask them or go and look at the FAQs for them. Often the FAQs on some of the crypto mailing lists are a damn sight more readable than the ones on the libraries. And they will quite frequently call out individual libraries and say, we recommend these libraries, but be aware of this, this, and this. And the reason why they're saying that is they know that 90% of their questions that come on the mailing list is in the form of, why well, I do this? So I would recommend doing that, but also you do want someone who'll be critical. If you can get someone else to eyeball your stuff, please do. Uh, so should you choose open source crypto? Yes, kind of, maybe, depends, situational. Um, any questions? No, I've killed them all. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have learned not to answer this question. The question is, uh, which TLS library do I endorse? So I say in the other generic form of 
uh, which software products do I endorse to do X, Y, and Z? And generally the answer to that is, it depends, I need to have a much longer conversation with you. Could there ever be enough rounds of obscurity that it becomes cryptography? Uh, not by the definition of cryptography, but is, is there enough rounds of security? Uh, of, of, the question is, is, could you ever have enough rounds of obscurity that it was effectively cryptography? Uh, there is a field of cryptography about hiding messages. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, you can only have uh, false... You, this is a very difficult one to prove. So the, the successful stenography obviously is successful, so we don't know about it. So all the ones that we do know about have obviously failed. Um, therefore, it's an unanswerable question. Um, but I would recommend it as a bad approach. <laughs> Yes, it, probably at the point when it's cryptography. Oh, yep. um, you said at the beginning that really it's about threat models and who you're trying to protect against. Yes. Um, given that uh, security is something which does make it more difficult for people, but as you say, it's just a speed bump, do you think it's an appropriate tool to deploy against mitigating against certain actors? I, I think for certain fields of security, obscurity is a valuable thing with, uh, along with other things. Yeah. Uh, I think in the field of you are obtaining from some other person something that is going to be encrypting messages, this is not something you as a purchaser should ever be keen in. Uh, I think if you are writing your own software that does crypto, the odds are that you screwed up the crypto, therefore I think we are talking about a problem that's irrelevant in that situation. Uh, but far more people are in the situation of, I'm going to use some crypto inside of my product. Which product should I use? At which point you absolutely should be saying, yes, I want the thing that had the most eyeballs on it, please, and that I can pay someone else to audit if I needed to, or hopefully somebody else has paid somebody else to audit. Yes? Um, the question is, do I think OpenSSL thwarted uh, lots of eyeballs uh, looking at cryptography? Or is it a good counterexample of lots of eyeballs? Um, no. <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the short version. The longer version. Um, inherently, if you have large, complicated libraries, just assuming that people will volunteer to spend three months of their lives to audit them, on a whim is, well, you probably will get some, but you're not going to get very many, and how many of them are actually going to know what they're doing? So uh, there's actually, if you're really interested in it, there's a lovely academic paper where someone attempts to make the argument that crypto is a special case, and that only the truly, truly skilled crypto people are allowed to look at crypto because everyone else just doesn't know what they're doing. It's not really been my experience of people who break crypto. I mean, people who break crypto for a living are very good at breaking crypto, and other people who don't break crypto for a living sometimes are very good at breaking crypto. Um, lots of things that go wrong, the vast majority of things that go wrong in crypto when you're actually attacking crypto are ludicrously simple. Or they are the same patterns that you see time and time again. And you see some things that end up looking really, really, you know, um, the whole class of crypto attacks called oracles, and which, the, the, which people write lots and lots of stuff about, but the very short version is, is that you can do something that gives you a false or positive result, and you can slowly learn information about the thing. So many of the concepts are really simple. And so if you just go through the library that's looking for anything that does something in an oracle-like way, you'll actually break a hell of a lot of crypto if you want to do it the other way around. If you go and read uh, academic literature and, and see in the academic literature how do you break crypto, what's really interesting about that is many of the things that are in the ac academic literature on how to break crypto have never been implemented by anyone, but all it takes is someone to go and read that paper and then go and audit a library. So if you want to go and break a bunch of crypto libraries, that's the easy way of doing it. Um, 
I think the bigger problem is like an economic one. The people with the right skills or the people with the right time or the right people with the right mindset are willing to sit down for long enough to look at it. Uh, but one of the other ways around this is that lots of these open source libraries get used by vast numbers of people and vast numbers of really big companies. And if they become slightly worried, they'd be amazed how much money they suddenly throw in a certain direction to get it fixed. It's just one of the confidences. The, the, the thing is, is that you see a repeated pattern. Uh, you, you see it with almost anything that uses crypto, where they come out at the beginning and everyone has complete confidence that the thing is good. It, it doesn't start with the no one has any confidence and, and uh, it, maybe in the security community no one has any confidence in it, but everyone else just assumes it must be secure. And then eventually something happens and the security goes, the confidence goes from way up there to way down here. And then you see it slowly climb up as people start to do things to fix it or the product just dies. Anyway, I'm running long. Alec is now going to entertain you. <laughs>